Hello, I'm Drakina Fell, naval historian, and I'm at the Tank Museum in Bovington, Dorset. You might be wondering what a naval historian is doing in a museum full of tanks. They are, of course, land-based, whereas I'm a bit more sea-based. And, well, there is actually a significant amount of naval history connected with certain tanks. And that's what we're going to look at today, a top five of naval-related tanks in some way, shape, or form. As for why we're standing in front of a Centurion in Korean-era format, well, those of you who've watched my channel quite regularly will know why I'm doing that. The Centurion itself doesn't have that much of a naval connection, but let's go and see some tanks that do. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. So, starting at number five, we have TOG2. Now, you might be thinking, Drac, what on earth has TOG2 got to do with the Navy, aside from the fact that it's very, very big? Well, actually, there's a surprising amount of secondary connections between TOG-2 and the Navy, and of course this is a list of naval-related tanks. Now, TOG-2 represents in many ways the end of the line of the World War I school of thought, and as we'll see a bit later, that World War I school of tank design thought started with the Navy in many ways. In fact, one of the designers of TOG-2 was a name that students of particularly World War I naval history will recognize immediately, Sir Eustace Dendecor or however you pronounce his surname, no one's ever quite able to agree on that. So there's still a very strong naval connection both in its heritage and in its designer. There's a strong naval element involved in the design of both TOG-1 and TOG-2, and of course when we look at TOG-2 there's a few other rather amusing connections with naval related design. So if we look at the front of TOG-2 you can see here everything is riveted together. Now obviously tanks at the time were riveted generally, although they would move on later to welding, but the form of riveting that's used on TOG-2 is very similar to the form of riveting that was used in the construction of naval vessels. Now, to be fair, at the time TOG-2 was constructed, naval vessels were gradually moving on to welding in the Royal Navy, but riveting was still either partially or wholly around, especially in some of the more emergency war-built vessels. Another thing that makes TOG-2 a bit more like a ship than a regular tank, apart from its sheer size, is its length to beam ratio. If you look at most tanks, they have a fairly short length to beam ratio. If you were to put a tank at sea, it wouldn't be able to keep its direction very well, it would bob around a lot, and that's a function of what works on land. TOG-2, still reflecting World War I thinking, trying to cross trenches but enhanced, is very long compared to its width. So, ironic as it might seem for something so large and so solid, TOG-2, if it was made amphibious, would actually be a much better river or sea-going tank than most other tanks would be. Uh, the long caterpillar treads as well will probably help with that, but it's a very interesting feature of TOG-2, which, although it relates to land warfare, does in some ways relate it to naval activity as well. Plus, of course, you have this 75mm gun. Although the 75mm in this particular case is not a naval-derived gun, it actually shares a caliber with a number of naval guns, albeit somewhat earlier. So TOG-2, although it's primarily seen as a child of the trenches, is actually in many ways the last gasp of significant naval influence on tank design, at least as far as what we would call today a main battle tank, in those days would be called a heavy tank. So there we go, number five the good old TOG-2. So, coming in at number four, we have the Buffalo, or the Landing Vehicle Tracked, or LVT Buffalo. Now, it might be fairly obvious why this has a naval connection, after all, it is a landing craft. But still, the story behind it is quite interesting. For hundreds of years, amphibious landings had been conducted just using whatever was to hand, usually ships' boats. By the time of the First World War, specialist landing craft were under development, and indeed some of them were used at Gallipoli. But the problem with all of these was that they were still fundamentally boats. 
and that meant there were certain draft limitations. They could only go into water that was so shallow. And whilst if you have a clear approach to the beach, that might be fine. If you have sandbars, rock banks, coral reefs, etc., it's not quite so good. And so you needed an amphibious landing craft that ideally could surmount low-lying land obstacles, travel over the water, and then when it arrived, go up the beach if at all possible. And that's where LVTs came in. As you can see, the hull is very, very much more boat shaped than your average tank. And that's because it is a fully amphibious vehicle. If you take a close look at the tracks, you'll notice that the tracks themselves, instead of having just the regular pads of a normal tank, they actually have these W-shaped scallops built into the tracks. And that's to help the tracks get traction in the water. So they act almost like two gigantic segmented paddle wheels, which gives them a lot more maneuverability and a lot more power through the water than your average semi-amphibious or amphibious adapted tank. Now, of course, that does come at a penalty. Unlike a main battle tank, or at the time these are being deployed, a light, medium or heavy tank, its armor isn't really much to write home about. It might stop a rifle bullet if you're lucky, but that's about it. But that's one of the things that's necessary in order to keep these things afloat under their own displacement, as opposed to, say, a duplex drive Sherman, which needs a big canvas flotation rig to give it enough displacement to stay somewhat vaguely afloat. Now, of course, the main purpose of this is to get troops ashore. So as it heads out from the landing craft, it can obviously power through the water. If it comes across a sandbar, it then reverts to, in some ways, a land-based mode. It can crawl over those and then continue on its merry way along up to the beach. Now, of course, if one of these things got hold, then there were some issues, but it's no better or worse than if you're in a ship's boat with the exception that obviously you can drive onto land, which ships boats can't do, which is quite a handy feature if you need some additional shelter, because even the best landing craft, if you're put down on a beach and there's enemy rifle and machine gun fire coming in, then that's the end of the line for you. You have to get out and rely on your own chances. Whereas in this thing, again, assuming it's small arms fire, you could just keep going up the beach. It obviously has a 50 cal here to help with suppressive fire, and we'll see where that takes you. Now, there were a series of LVTs. The Buffalo is an LVT-4, and that has a particularly interesting feature which the earlier LVTs didn't have. So let's go and see what that is. And here we are. Now, what you might be thinking, okay, Drac, where's the special feature? Where's the special feature? It's right here, it's this ramp. The earlier LVTs didn't have one. LVT-4s, which is what this one is, they, they have this ramp. Now, the interesting thing about this ramp is it makes getting out of the craft a lot, lot easier. And you might think, well, that's obvious. The down ramp is obviously very helpful, but it does need to be stressed just how large this vehicle is in comparison to other tanks of the time. We're surrounded by tanks that you can't see, but if you come down to the tank museum, you can see. And where I'm standing, which is on the floor of the Buffalo, is very nearly at the top of the hull of most of the other period tanks that are surrounding us. So you've then got these very high walls. Now, all of this is necessary to allow the LVT to float. But as you can see, I mean, I'm about six foot. It would be difficult enough for me, just addressed as I am now, to get up and over this quickly. There's a little step here, but that doesn't make it too much easier. Now imagine trying to do that whilst you're under fire wearing full kit. You know, it's not going to be the world's easiest thing to do. So having a ramp actually makes things much, much easier for the troops to get out onto the beach. The other thing that makes this ramp quite useful is that unlike ramps that you see on, say, Saving Private Ryan or however many documentaries there have been about D-Day, all of those ramps on landing ships open at the front, which in many movies obviously has the rather predictable result of the enemy waiting with a machine gun to open up as soon as the ramp drops and then you're trapped. This ramp is at the back. We're filming from the back. There's the front, there's the machine gun we saw earlier. So if the troops are exiting from an LVT, assuming that the front is still pointing at the enemy, they're not exiting straight into enemy fire, and they have the limited, I suppose, cover of the two sides to hide behind at first, which is something of a help because it means that when those troops do eventually emerge and charge forward, it's gonna be a little bit of a surprise for the enemy. So that's the key feature of the LVT-4 Buffalo that makes it superior to many of its predecessors. And 
therefore you can understand why it's earned a place at number four on my list of naval related armored vehicles. Now, you might be wondering, what has this got to do with the Navy? Well, this has a couple of things naval related, but also there's quite a story behind the Scorpion itself. Now, the naval related part of the Scorpion it is part of the CVRT family, so it's quite a small, lightweight vehicle. But you notice this runner that goes all the way around. So this is a built-in skirt for amphibious operations. So it's a lightweight vehicle. It's not fully amphibious just on its own, but this pops up and it can swim. So there is a certain degree of water-related activity for the Scorpion in that respect. But the main reason that I've chosen this is not because of any particular design reference uh, that the Navy had to do with the Scorpion, but because of its operational history. The Scorpion, along with a couple of scimitars, was one of the very, very few armored vehicles that was able to be deployed during the Falklands War, which of course involved the Navy to a huge extent, because that was the only way you were going to get to the Falklands. And of course, that not only involved getting there, it involved an amphibious operation. So about half a dozen or so CVRT family members were able to actually land. And in particular, the Scorpion, with its incredibly small footprint. So there's tracks down here, obviously spread the weight of the tank around, and that footprint is actually, the ground pressure is so low, it's less than a human footprint is. So this vehicle can actually go places that a human couldn't. So if you're trekking around over rough terrain and swampy terrain and muddy terrain in the Falklands, this can actually go where the soldiers can't. And as a result, because it was small, it was lightweight, it was able to be deployed by the Royal Navy, the Scorpion was a huge assistance during the retaking of the Falkland Islands, in part simply because it was just an armored vehicle presence where there otherwise wouldn't have been an armored vehicle presence, but also in terms of its morale effect, because it's not just about having a short barrel 75 millimeter gun, which is somewhat useful. It's also about the fact that it means the British have a tank, if you like, when the Argentines don't. And it also means you can use it for all sorts of psychological operations. So for example, at night, if you're going to launch an attack, you have the Scorpion sitting there in the darkness off to one side, revving its engine up. And now your opponents know that there's an armored vehicle out there somewhere, but they don't know exactly what kind of armored vehicle it is, where it's going, what it might do to them. And that gives you a huge tactical advantage. But it's only thanks to the amphibious landing capabilities afforded to the operation by the Royal Navy that the Scorpion was able to be deployed. So that very, very close connection between this vehicle and the Royal Navy in the context of the Falklands is why I've labeled this in the list of top five naval related tanks. And of course, I just really like the thing as well and it's my list. So there you go. So, here at number two, we have the T-55. This is a Soviet-designed, early Cold War-era main battle tank. So you might be thinking, what on earth does this have to do with the Navy? Was it like TOG-2, somewhat designed by naval officers? No. Also unlike TOG-2, it's not particularly long compared to its width, so it doesn't have a naval profile there. We've seen Buffalo. Is it amphibious? Is it an amphibious landing craft? Uh, well, it's not, it's a main battle tank. And we've seen Scorpion. Did it take part in any major notable amphibious operations? Again, no. So what does the T-55 have to do with the Navy other than perhaps being very cramped inside, a bit like a U-boat? Well, not even that is really in common with the Navy because, well, I've been in U-boats and this is a lot more cramped than a U-boat. If it wasn't for the fact that this hatch has been removed, I would be spending this entire segment hunched over a bit like Gollum. And I think if I had to spend any kind of extensive time here, let, let's say if I was a crewman, I'd be scuffling sideways out of it when I had to get out. I mean, you know, I'm not exactly the world's tallest person, but I'm wedged up against every conceivable surface in this thing without the hatch being in here. I can only imagine what would happen if we tried to fit someone like Chieftain in here, although it would be quite amusing for everyone who wasn't called Chieftain. But the business end of the T-55 starts here. So this is the D-10T gun. Now we have the breech and presumably the hyper-flexible loader would reach somewhere behind me, pick up some 
shells and some charges and put them in here to send down range. This is where the naval connection comes in. But, so I can unfold myself origami style, let's go round to the business end and have a closer look at that element of the tank. So here is the D10T 100 millimeter gun. Now, this is basically a naval gun. Back when they were looking at how to arm the T-55, they needed a high velocity gun to get the shells to go a fairly long way and hit with a lot of energy to penetrate the armor of opposition tanks. And to do that, they could either try and build a brand new gun, but a lot of land-based weapons they might try and adapt are generally slightly shorter barrel to enable easier transit over land. Whereas at sea, as we've mentioned earlier, longer barrel guns are easily able to be mounted because they're just in a fixed position or in a turret, they don't go anywhere. And anti-aircraft guns and dual purpose guns designed for anti-aircraft and anti-shipping use had to be very high velocity because they had to punch a heavy weight anti-aircraft shell quite high into the sky and they had to have the range and penetration power to deal with small craft like destroyers. And so a dual purpose weapon from the Navy would make an excellent anti-tank gun, much in the same way as in World War II, the Germans had adapted the 88 mm anti-aircraft gun into an 88 mm anti-tank gun. And in this case, they had the 100 mm gun, which was already mounted on a number of Soviet naval vessels, as I said, a dual purpose weapon. And they took that, they adapted it very slightly, and then they stuck it in the T-55 and they had a ready-made high velocity 100 mm anti-tank weapon which was at just the right caliber for the kind of tanks that were being developed in the early Cold War. Because remember in the, in the Second World War you would kind of ended on 75, 88, 90 mm guns but at the time of the T-55, they hadn't graduated up to the 105, 120 and 125 mm guns that were characterized by the late Cold War and even tanks of today. So the 100 mm sat right in the middle of that, which meant that the T-55 had a very long range, very powerful weapon for its time. And it meant that research and development costs were a lot less because they already had most of what they needed. They just had to work out how to adapt it to squeeze it into what is ultimately a relatively small tank. So there you go. Number two, the T-55 Soviet main battle tank. And so my number one tank with a naval connection is also called, ironically enough, the Mark I tank. And as the name suggests, it not only is the first tank in British Army service, but pretty much the first tank to go into service as we understand the use of tanks today. And of course, here it is. Now, you might be wondering, how does this thing have a naval connection other than the fact the hull looks vaguely boat-like? Well, there's actually quite an extensive naval connection with the Mark I. The Royal Naval Air Service was one of the very first organisations to work with armoured fighting vehicles of any sort, mostly armoured cars, at the start of the First World War. And so when it was decided that a much heavier trench crossing armoured fighting vehicle was needed, the Navy got involved due to their aforementioned experience. And one of the early names that this thing had was a land ship, derived from the fact that one of the earliest committees to look at developing it was called the Land Ship Committee. And as that name suggests, that's where the Royal Navy came in. There's also other connections. For example, on the sponsons here, we see the six pounder gun. Now the six pounder gun is originally a naval gun deployed through the Royal Navy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, originally made by Hotchkiss, and it was used as an anti-torpedo boat weapon. However, by the 1910s, the six pounder was really a bit too small, a bit too short range, and not powerful enough to take out the newer, heavier torpedo boats and destroyers that were being deployed by the high seas fleet. The Royal Navy moved on to four inch and six inch guns at that point, and that meant that there were a lot of six pounders that were going spare. So when the land ship was initially constructed, the Navy was able to give a fairly significant number of these surplus six pounders to outfit the Mark I tanks. There weren't actually enough of them spare to outfit all the Mark I tanks, but there were a reasonable number. Now, what you can notice about the Mark I, which distinguishes it quite easily visually from its later uh, success of the Mark IV, is that these six pounders have quite long barrels. And this is because they are the original naval six pounders put straight into service on the tanks. However, it was found that the six-pounder 
had an annoying tendency to dig its barrel into the mud when the tank was going up and down trenches. Now, having a long barrel wasn't a disadvantage at sea, it was actually an advantage because the long barrel meant it could reach out further, but the kind of ranges that the six pounder could achieve whilst obsolete in naval service were actually too far for the engagements a tank was fighting in the trenches of the Western Front. And so the barrel would be cut down. And so if you see a Mark IV tank, whilst the rhomboid shape and the sponsor and guns are pretty much the same, you'll notice that the six pounders on the Mark IV are considerably shorter in order to avoid this snagging issue. So there we go, the Mark I tank of the British Army with an incredibly close connection to the sea. Well, that's my top five naval related tanks filmed down here at the wonderful tank museum in Bovington in Dorset. So I've been Drakinafel, and indeed I still am. So if you'd like to know a bit more about the floating versions of these armored boxes armed with guns, then go and check out my channel. Um, and obviously the Tank Museum have very, very kindly allowed me to film at their facilities. So please subscribe to their channel, which is obviously where this video is appearing. And if you can, please support them on Patreon as well. Now, of course, there is an additional benefit to all of this, which is that if they get enough new subscribers and patrons, they might let me out of this turret, and then I don't have to spend the rest of my life stuck as a T-55 gunner, which would be really nice. So please do that. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>